Greetings and shalom, my friends. My name is Ron Smith, and welcome to this particular ministry. We call it Scholar Ministries. And uh, scholar there, Yadan, is from the Hebrew Yada, which means we want to intimately know our God. We want to intimately know the truth. It doesn't mean that we're a bunch of big shots. We, we're really just pretty simple folks, but we really just want to know our Lord. And so what we're doing here is we're studying through the first five books of the Bible plus the prophets and whatever word we may pick up to understand this better. And this week we are studying a portion in Exodus. We're in Exodus, and this portion is called Mishpatim. The Mishpatim are court rulings, statutes, that are not commanded, but they are set before us so that we can take a look at uh, these guidelines, if you will, and know how to learn or know how to live a responsible life. How to live responsibly. We've been studying that, and that goes hand in hand with the, uh, the portion prior to that, which includes Exodus chapter 20. So, really, we're looking at the covenant. The covenant. Now, Today we're going to take a look at Exodus chapter 23 and 24. And before we go right into that, let's pray for just a bit. Our Heavenly Father, Avinu Meshaf. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, Avinu, we love you. We are grateful for everything that you give us. We are grateful for the simple fact that you give. You're a giving God. In fact, that is what agape is. You give and you give and you give and if there's anything that you need it's a need to give so we are grateful that we can learn from you and how to be how to follow your kind of love we do not love out of a need for anything but we wish to grow into a giving love and so we are grateful and we are grateful for giving us the Torah to for giving us the Bible that we can look at and find your character therein as well as the character that we are to follow and the life that we are to live responsibly and father with that we ask that you would guide us and direct us and anoint this time by your spirit anoint this time with your spirit that we may do and obey do and understand b'shem yeshua amen well let's look uh Exodus chapter 23, verses 1 through, uh, verses 1 through 3. I'll probably, well, okay, I'll go ahead and read my note here. Uh, actually, we're going to not take in those particulars. So I already read that yesterday, didn't I? We'll start at verse 20. Uh, verse 20 through 22, let me get my head on straight. It says, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you on, on the way, on the road, and bring you to the place I have prepared. Prepared. There's God has prepared a place for his people. Pay attention to him. Listen to what he says. And do not rebel against him. Because he will not forgive any wrongdoing of yours. Since my name resides in him. But if you listen to what he says. And do everything I tell you. Then I will be, I will be an enemy to your enemies. And a foe to your foes. Okay. Well, the Malak Adonai, the, the messenger of the Lord, the angel, angel is a Greek word, the English word would be messenger, and he is someone we have actually already met. We, we met him earlier when we noted that he lived in and is part and parcel with the pillar of cloud and fire, the presence who went before Israel and who moved to the position of behind them to form a guard between Israel and Egypt, between Israel and Mitzrayim, there in front of a place called pa Pihakirot. Uh, that's all recorded there in Exodus chapter 14, but I wanted to note that we really have met this particular person. Before that, we met him with Moshe, with Moses in the burning bush, when that one individual was called the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord. He was also called called God. He was also called yod heh He was called the covenant name. That one person was called those things. Now, that presence here is introduced to us in, more formally, if you will. 
And phrases in this, these particular verses that I read, phrases like, my name is in him, are also, there are phrases like, well, these are actually juxtapositioned with one another. Phrases like, his voice and I speak. This gives the messenger something of a unique identity. And I've already pointed this out in Exodus chapter 3. This, this messenger, this angel, again, is also called God, and he is also called the covenant name. Here in our passage, a little bit more formal, he is also referred to as, as his personage, but, it, but God is speaking as when you hear his voice, it's me speaking. A relatively small strand of Kabbalistic Judaism has referred to this personage as the Metatron. Now when I say a relatively small strand of Kabbalistic Judaism, what I mean is not all of Orthodox Judaism is terribly interested in the Kabbalah. Just like all, not all of Christianity is terribly interested in Kabbalah. Prior to, uh, prior to Hollywood getting a hold of Kabbalah in the 1800s. Kabbalah was considered in Christian colleges in America. Kabbalah was considered uh, a book that really sounded a whole lot like the New Testament. But then again, Hollywood got a hold of it, and now it's nothing more than some weird mysticism to us. But Kabbalah's, Kabbalah refers to the, the angel of the Lord as Metatron, while some strands of Christendom identify this person as Yeshua, or Jesus, in this particular role. It's the same thing. So you can understand easily my own leaning. I, still, I don't mind retaining a bit of mystery when I read these things. In fact, I can hardly help do so, <laughs> because Metatron is a rather mysterious figure. And in Judaism, for less 1800 years has spoken in somewhat mysterious uh, a mystical imagery because it kind of kept them out of trouble to say that a Orthodox Jewish person believes in Jesus as the Messiah was considered heresy for hundreds of years because you couldn't be Jewish and believe in the Messiah you know, even though <laughs> anyway it, it makes no sense no but uh, wanted to explain kind of uh, how this personage is uh, dealt with within both Judaism and Christendom. The messenger, the angel spoken of above, is quite forgiving, yes. He carries even that power. However, he will not forgive a category of sin called Pesha. In Hebrew, Pesha, translated wrongdoing in what I just read, you are sin, otherwise he will not forgive your sin. Literally, he will not forgive your high-handed rebellion, or anomia. The Greek word here would be anomia, or Torahlessness, or that being against Torah. So, he will not forgive this particular kind of sin. It's, it's reminiscent of Matthew chapter 7 at the end of it, saying, Many will come to me, saying, Lord, Lord, have we not done all of these wonderful things. We've cast out demons in your name. We've raised the dead. We've done stuff to really catch your eye. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of Anomia, you workers of Pesha. So even there, Yeshua says, he's not, that's a particular uh, category, if you like, of sin. That's called Pesha. That's called Torahlessness. That's called against his Bible. Okay. Well, we did all these marvelous things. We, we call you Lord. We, we, you know, we are part of this culture that calls you Lord, and we do all these marvelous things, but we're not going to follow your book. He says, get away from me. Okay, so that messenger is described the same way in the part that we just read in Exodus chapter 23. Let's read chapter 23 of Exodus, verses 23 and 24. It says, when my angel goes ahead of you and brings you to the Emery, the Hiti, Peruzi, Kenani, Hivi, and Uvisi, <laughs> I will make an end of them. You are not to worship their gods, serve them, or follow their practices. Rather, you are to demolish them completely and smash their standing stones to pieces. Unquote. So, 
The aforementioned messenger, the angel, is called such because he, quote, goes before. Okay, that's an essence, a messenger or angel goes before. We understand what a messenger does. He goes in front of Israel as they travel into the land promised to them. He does this going before, going in front of them, again, in the form of a pillar of cloud and of fire, day and night respectively. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, well, you know, it's called protection. Protection from the sun and warmth at night. God's a practical God, right? Speaking of uh, Orthodox Judaism and how it speaks of the messenger, I, I told you about Kabbalah. Let me read to you from Midrash. Now, this is uh, sages of old, you know, Orthodox Judaism. From Midrash Rabbah, quote, it quotes from this passage, Behold, I send before you an angel. Midrash Rabbah says, Whenever the angel appeared, the Shekinah, the Shekinah, appeared. As it says, and the Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And immediately after that, it says, God called unto him. In verse 4. Moreover, salvation cometh to Israel wherever they, wherever they cry unto him. At the thorn bush, behold, the cry of uh, the children of Israel is come unto me. In the case of Gideon, and the angel of the Lord came, and the angel of the Lord appeared. And the Lord said, God is in thy, God is thy might and will save Israel. Judges chapter 6, verse 11 through 14. In the millennium, likewise, when he will reveal himself, salvation will come to Israel. When he, the angel, when he, the messenger, will reveal himself, Yeshua, salvation, Jesus, will come to Israel. As it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall clear the way before me. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Even a note on that, now, that's a quote from, all of that is a quote from Midrash Rabbah. Even a footnote on that says, Whenever Israel cries unto God, the angel appears. He is the herald of Yeshua. He is the herald of salvation. Okay, so when, when he comes, there will be salvation meaning when he comes again when he comes in the it says when he comes in the millennial in the beginning of the millennial age okay that is midrash Rabbah, that is orthodox judaism before we said that jews aren't allowed to believe in jesus in the above quote along with editor's notes there is actually considerable conversation before the quote that i gave here which is something of a summation of everything of everyone that has said in their piece. I quote it because, as we know, the Hebrew word for salvation is the same as the Messiah's name. So, I wanted to point out that what we all understand about this messenger, about this angel, and there's actually more understood about it within Orthodox Judaism even than within Christendom. So I thought I'd share that with you. Well, it says in Hebrew also, Ki yelek Malachi Lefenica, that is, my, because my messenger will walk before you, it says will go before you, he will walk before you. This presence called the messenger, the angel, did not hover far above the ground. He walked ahead of the camp called Israel. Other interesting language within Exodus 23, verse 23, is the fact that the Lord is now speaking of cutting off those inhabitants of the land. In the mind of this reader, one is cut off from covenant. You're not cut off if you're not in covenant. Did the preaching, perhaps, of Avraham, the preaching of Abraham and Melchizedek, bring those inhabitants of Canaan into covenant some 400 years earlier? He, Abraham is called a herald of righteousness, just as the angel is called a herald of righteousness. Did Abraham's preaching, along with Melchizedek, bring those people into covenant 400 years earlier? If that question is, to, is believed to be uh, yeah, with an affirmative answer, did it take 400 years then for those people to 
walk off the path and go astray to the point of, you know, great abominations, great turning away from his word. And I'm not going to give you the history of Cain, and I find that when I, when I really do tell you what they were doing, it's a, it, it sickens us, and understandably. But my question is, well, I'll just tell you the point of my question. If you look through society, if you look through the last 6,000 years of history, uh, by, by generalities, I guess, I, I don't want to say that every situation is like this, but uh, far and wide, it takes about 400 years, somewhere around 400 years for a people to rise up and a people to go stray, a people to rise up and a people to go to their ruin, uh, to come to an end. As it says in the text here, to come, I, I will bring them to their end. The word end in Hebrew, Ephes, gives us the word Ephesim or Ephesians. It's a, it's a people who have come to nothing, to, have come to naught, who don't really define anything. They've lost all definition of things. Because they've gone so far astray that even words don't mean anything anymore. Okay, So this is the position of Canaan at this point of our reading. They have come to absolutely nothing more than animalistic instincts. So the text will say, you are not to go after their practices, to follow their practices. We are called to live at peace within whatever host nation we live in, right? But being in but not of this world means that we do not have any need to take up the ways and means of whatever host nation we may be in, including modern America. America as a whole is getting closer and closer to perhaps being cut off from God's covenant, so it would seem. I, however, have, I retain a hope. There is a hope within us that individuals can repent. And if individuals can repent, so can a nation. Okay? We are a nation of about, well, I mean, as far as people coming here from, from, uh, from the Netherlands and then f from England and various parts of the world, we're a nation that's about 400 years of age. But I have hope. Yes, we, have, we are seemingly coming to that place where nothing means anything anymore. You know, God bringing us to naught, bringing us to the end, but I have hope for many individuals, and we must also, as believers, have hope for many individuals. Okay? Exodus chapter 23, verses 25 through 26. It says, You are not to serve Adonai your God, or pardon me, you are to serve, you are to serve Adonai your God, and he will bless your food and water. In fact, I will take sickness away from you. In your land, your women will not miscarry or be barren, and you will live out the full span of your lives. I will send terror of me ahead of you, throwing into confusion all the people to whom you come, and I will make all of your enemies turn their backs on you. I may have read more than I said I was going to read, but there are promises here. And these promises are predicated on, quote, you are to serve the Lord your God. Those promises include, quote, he will bless your food and water. And, quote, I will take sickness away from among you, unquote. Finally, it is with, when Israel comes into the land of Israel that the Lord says, quote, your women will not miscarry or be barren, and you will live out the full span of your lives." Unquote. So though practically every nation has trampled on the land of Israel, that land has never been a blessing to anyone. The land of Israel has never been a blessing to anyone except for the people of Israel. This is because that land, and far more actually, is part and parcel of the covenant given specifically to Israel and to no one else. But even for Israel, the covenant is a two-way street. That's what covenant is. We remember that God said to Abraham, 
quote, your seed will inherit the gates of his enemies as a result that you listen to my voice. Genesis 22, verses 17 and 18. So, even for Israel in their land, yeah, I understand. Deuteronomy says that God, he portioned out land for all of the major people groups, 70 nations, 70 major people groups in the world still today. Not too long ago, 70 nations gathered in Paris. There are 70 major people groups, even today, 70 nations. And God has, God himself, not the, you know, the United Nations, but God himself has given the boundaries of those nations and the boundaries for Israel. Each one of those nations or each one of those people groups dwell in their land and are prosperous in their land if they follow the Lord in their land. Israel must follow the Lord in the land of Israel. If they don't, they too will be cut off. That's just what covenant is. Okay? I think we understand that, so I won't harp on it further. Exodus chapter 23 verses 27 through 20 or through verse 80 uh, verse 30 goodness numbers and Ron now, I've already read verse 28 but I'll read on a little further I will send hornets ahead of you to drive out the Hivi the Kenani the Hiti from before you I will not drive out from before you I will not drive them out in one year which would cause the land to become desolate and the wild animals too many for you. I will drive them out from before you gradually until you have grown in number and can take possession of the land. So you will re recall that Joshua, Yehoshua, did not have to fight each and every war for the land which Abraham and his kin purchased. They purchased in part, they purchased the land of Israel. Rather, terror of Israel went ahead of them, even before Joshua's leadership. Often the Lord caused all, quote-unquote, all of enemies of Israel to turn their backs on Israel. That is, they tucked their tail and ran. Okay. Moses says in Exodus 34, he pleads that the Lord will, that the presence of the Lord would go before Israel. And he says, he tells us why. He says, if your presence doesn't go before us, we won't be distinguished. We will not look any different from anybody else. It is your presence, O Lord, that distinguishes us from all other peoples on the planet. And it is his presence, my friends, that caused the the people of Canaan as well as the people of Moab to greatly fear the people of Israel because they saw the God of Israel with them and so they said hey you know we we either want to come in covenant with this God or tuck our tails and run so Joshua actually didn't end up having to to fight everybody uh, there wasn't that many wars that he had to really actually pursue Another facet of these promises is the pesky presence of the hornet, likely of the sort from Africa, which was brought into the USA later. A hornet is one of a number of variety of wasp, which can become quite determined in their attacks. You know, sometimes wasps will leave you alone. More often than not, if you're around them, they will come after you. So... That's basically one of those little facets that the Lord uh, uses when Joshua came into Canaan. There were wasps coming ahead of him. <laughs> so, just an interesting little detail. All of the above promises were ways of ye old inhabitants of Canaan getting up and leaving that land. Still, it would not come all at once, but over an elongated period of time, lest wild animals become overly hungry too soon. You know, all the inhabitants get up and skedaddle, skedaddle and the wild animals say, wait, where's all of our food? So, <laughs> oh, here, here come some Israelis, we'll just get them. So no, it, it was a gradual thing. Let's read Exodus chapter 23, verses 31 through 33. It says, I will set your boundaries from the Sea of Suf, the Sea of the Pilishtim, 
and from the desert to the Euphrates River. For, for I will hand the inhabitants of the land over to you, and you will drive them out from before you. You are not to make a covenant with them or with their gods. They will not live in your land, otherwise they will... Or they are not to live in your land, otherwise they will make you sin against me by ensnaring you to serve their gods. Well, the Sea of Suf, he's giving boundaries here. The Sea of Suf is called the Red Sea in most translations. It actually means the sea at the end. It's also called the Gulf of Suez today. It's at the westernmost finger of the Arabian Sea. The Sea of the Philistines is commonly thought to be the Mediterranean Sea. And actually the Bible in Numbers 34 and Ezekiel 47 refers to the Great Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, as the western border of Israel. The desert would most likely be uh, what has become called the Sinai Desert. It was called the Sinai Desert by Helena, the mother of Emperor Constantine. She called it Sinai because she believed that Mount Sinai was in the northern part of Egypt. Um, the Bible says it's in Arabia, and those are two different places, but that's okay. The river is most always the, Euphr the Euphrates River. So there are times, there have been a time or two, when the boundaries of Israel reached the biblical boundaries given here. Uh, King Solomon's time is probably the closest that it ever came to fulfilling the boundaries given. But the Euphrates River, of course, goes into what we call Iraq today. Perhaps the worst, o the worst overall sin that the Bible speaks of is that uh, of assimilation. It says here that we are to not allow, the people of Israel are not to allow the inhabitants of the land to, uh, to, uh, uh, to influence us. But the, the influence there is called assimilation. Now, we speak in America today of assimilation as in you come to America and you assimilate into being American, meaning you take up our values, our, our covenant, our constitution. But assimilation to Israel means to, to leave that constitution. If you assimilate into other people's societies as an Israeli, that meant you were leaving God's constitution, his Bible. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here in this particular context. Let's read Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. It says, To Moshe, God said, Adonai said, Come up to Adonai, you, Aharon, Nadav, Avihu, and seventy elders, seventy leaders of Israel, prostrate yourselves at a distance while Moshe alone approaches Adonai. The others are not to approach, and the people are not to go up with them. Moshe came and told the people everything Adonai had said, including all the rulings. The people answered with one voice, We will, do, we will obey every word Adonai has spoken. We'll come up to the Lord. The Lord, Yodhevav, had located himself at the top of the mountain, at the top of the mountain of Sinai. Seventy four folk altogether went up and prostrated themselves before Yah in ye old physical position of worship. Moshe alone was to get close to the Lord, and Moshe then reports both the words of the Lord as well as the Mishpatim. All the words that we have just read through, the Ten Commandments and the, the words of Exodus 21 through 23. He repeats all those things as the people then affirm the covenant in unison. We will obey every word that the Lord has spoken. Every word will be obeyed and not every mishpat. Okay? The Ten Commandments are called the Ten Words every word that Adonai has spoken. The Mishpatim are within the covenant, but again, they're not obeyed because they're not commanded. 
They're not even spoken. They were written down and posted ahead, posted in front of the people. This means that we, we most certainly take the Mishpatim well into account. Okay, those things that I read through in Exodus 21 and 22, we take those well into account. As I often noted before, this means that we take them into account as a just and responsible lifestyle. We obey as though commanded each of the ten words, each of the ten commandments. Okay, so I'm, I'm not telling you that you have to build an altar uh, made of stone and so on and so forth although you know altar is a Latin word the English word is grill if you want to make a grill out of stonework that's wonderful that's fine the Bible is not commanding you to do that it's just saying if you do do it this way okay Exodus 24 verses 4 through 8 it says Moshe wrote down all the words of Adonai he rose early in the morning, built an altar at the base of the mountain, and set upright twelve large stones to represent the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent the young men of, of the people of Israel to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of Adonai, of oxen to Adonai. Pardon me. Moshe took half of the blood and put it in basins. The other half of the blood he splashed against the altar. Now, altar again is a Latin word. It means a barbecue grill. Okay, He splashed the blood against the barbecue grill. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud so that the people could hear. And they responded, quote, Everything that Adonai has spoken we will do and obey. Unquote. Moshe took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the, this is the blood of the covenant which Adonai has made with you in accordance with all these words. Okay, so basically, I, I don't have to say a lot here, but upon writing down all the words of Adonai, Moshe got up early, he built a grill, with twelve stones around as a representation of the folks, and young men offered scent offerings, translated burnt offerings, that's from the Latin Vulgate again, and they offered peace, uh, offerings that represented peace. They represented shalom. And they, they did it up big with oxen for a meal. You know, shalom offerings or peace offerings are those that are eaten. So, you know, oxen offered were able to feed people. Half of the blood of said offerings is splashed on the altar and the other half is sprinkled on the people after having read the Sefer Haberit, the Book of the Covenant, to them, as they responded with, quote, Everything that the Lord has spoken we will do and obey. The sprinkling is done with the words, This is the blood of the covenant. Okay. Now, just as Moses said, This is the blood of the covenant, so also Jesus said, This is the blood of the covenant. Okay. And it is the same covenant. When, when it's presented to us as the new covenant the word new there is the greek word is kindness which means refreshed or renewed it's the same covenant but it's refreshed and renewed it's uh, in fact the covenant will go through a few different renewals because it, it needs to be renewed every now and then we we kind of we kind of get brittle after a while the covenant gets brittle well, the covenant meal between Yah and the leaders of Israel will next be spoken of. I'll read it in Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. Moshe, Aharon, Nadav, Avihu, and the seventy elders, the seventy leaders, went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a sapphire stone pavement as clear as the sky itself. As clear as the sky itself literally means... Um, like a building in front of them. Tavnit. He did not reach out his hand against the notables of Israel. On the contrary, they saw God, even as they were eating and drinking. Okay, so this is covenant meal. The 74 went, went on up and they saw God. The description here is repeated. Just the description of all that they experienced is repeated in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. 
that's also repeated in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. Okay, So you have Exodus 24, Ezekiel 1, and Revelation 1. All of those sound very similar. The only other place that sounds actually very similar is what I just repeated earlier when 12 are sitting at a table and of course the way we depict it is they're all facing the same direction but nonetheless they're sitting at a table and Yeshua Jesus says this is the blood of the covenant shed for you so they're all eating this this covenant they see God they see this situation he's sitting in a building just above their heads and it's I don't know I just think it's really cool stuff so Exodus chapter 24 verses 12 through 14 and uh, quite nearly finished with this particular portion Adonai said to Moshe come up to me on the mountain and stay there I will give you the stone tablets with the Torah and the mitzvot with the teaching and the commands I have written on them so that you can teach them so that you can teach them Moshe got up and Yehoshua or Joshua his assistant and Moshe went up onto the mountain of God to the leaders he said stay here for us stay here for us until we come back to you see Aharon and Hur are with you whoever has a problem should turn to them so really you've got he says we he's taking Joshua with him Moses went up onto the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain so so far we have been speaking of the words and the Mishpatim, the, the words, the Ten Commandments, and the statutes that Moses reported to the people. He wrote them down with the Book of the Covenant being recorded them. And for whatever reason, once the stone tablets are mentioned as bearing, quote, the Torah and the commands, commentators keep to a tradition that these tablets contain only the top ten, only the Ten Commandments. Whereas what we're reading here says that he wrote both the words, that the words is a reference to the Ten Commandments, as well as that which follows. It's the whole covenant. In ancient treaties of the territory, a copy of the full covenant would be recorded on one tablet, with a second copy of the full covenant carved into a second tablet. One tablet was for the God of that people, and the second was for the people themselves. I personally believe that the tablets, plural, contain Exodus chapter 21, verse 1, through chapter 23, verse 19 which is called the Sefer Habrit, the Book of the Covenant. That is the covenant. Let's read Exodus chapter 24, verses 15 through 18. But before I read it, I think the reason why we tend to believe that only the Ten Commandments were written on those tablets is because we're thinking of English or Latin, uh, languages that wouldn't fit on those, lang on those tablets, uh, especially modern American English. We... We take a lot of words to describe one thing, but Hebrew is not like that. You can describe a whole lot of stuff within one word, and the people understood it. So it doesn't take up very much room. It's uh, efficient, I guess would be the word. Uh, Exodus 24, verses 15 through 18 says, Moshe went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Adonai stayed on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the cloud. To the people of Israel, the glory of Adonai looked like a raging fire on top of the mountain. Moshe entered the cloud and went up onto the mountain. He was on the mountain forty days and nights. And that ends that portion, but Moshe went on to are into the cloud of God's glory, glory meaning his direct presence. The seventh day is, you know, quite likely Yom HaShabbat or the Sabbath day. Most any commentator agrees with that. From Shabbat, from the Sabbath day until 40 days and nights later, Moshe remained in the glory, the direct presence of the Lord. And it says that he, he was on the mountain. He was up there on the mountain where the Lord is. And then the Lord says, come on up 
into the mountain. It's interesting language. He's the Lord is calling Moses, who's you know at the top of the mountain, to come on up into the mountain. <laughs> so uh, basically, he's saying, "Hey, come on into my presence." Well, this Shabbat today, I'm speaking this on Shabbat. This is called Shabbat Shekelim. This is a uh, a special Sabbath that follows the reading of this portion. There are a number, actually, of special Shabbats. And this one's called Shabbat Shekelim. Shekelim means shekels. The reading for this particular Shabbat is Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, which speaks of the injunction to avoid plague by assigning equal value to each person. Um, I'll tell you what, let me go ahead and turn here. We're going to read of it not too many weeks ahead, actually, a couple. But I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn there since I'm talking about it. Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16 says, Adonai said to Moshe, When you take a census of the people of Israel and register them, each upon registration is to pay a ransom for his life to Adonai to avoid any breakout of plague among them during the time of the census. Everyone subject to this census is to pay as an offering to Adonai half a shekel, which is about a fifth of an ounce of silver, <clears throat> by the standard she uh, sanctuary shekel. A uh, shekel equals 20 geras. Everyone over 20 years of age who is subject to the census is to give this offering to Adonai. The rich is not to give more or the poor to give less than half a shekel when given, giving Adonai's offering to atone for their lives. You are to take the atonement money from the people of Israel and use it for the service in the tent of meeting so that it will be a reminder of the people of Israel before Adonai to atone for their lives. Now let me, um, that's the reading of uh, Exodus 30, 11 through 16, but let me tell you that the she the silver shekels that were taken from the people when a census was taken were placed, they were formed into uh, the silver base on which the uh, on which the tabernacle was built. And when that was done, they were called the, the shekelim, the shekels of redemption, the base of redemption. It was, uh, it meant that the people's lives had been redeemed. And the tabernacle was therefore built on redemption. It was, re it was built on literal silver shekels of redemption and it was built on the concept of redemption. And they were, the people, you were never to take a census in Israel without assigning value, equal value, to everyone. And that is so that no plague would break out. You will remember that King David sought to count the folks without this command to assign a value to each person, an equal value to each person of Israel. And a plague very quickly resulted when he, he took a census without requiring that. A plague broke out, just as it says in Exodus chapter 30. So a purchasing of a threshing floor as a site for the future temple caused the plague to cease. The threshing floor, the reason why the plague ceased, was the threshing floor and oxen were purchased at the price of one and a half quarter pounds of shekels, that is, value was assigned to Israel. Equal value to the Israelis involved. Had had King David not done that, had he not actually purchased that property with silver shekels, that plague would have continued. Equal value must be assigned to each person. Let's talk about the Haftarah. The Haftarah is the reading after the Torah, the reading of the prophets that follows each portion. This week's Haftarah is Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 8 through verse 22, as well as 33, 25 through 26. And I'm, I'm not going to read all that. I've already read Exodus 30 in part, but I want to just give you the story. The year is 589 B.C., and Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to the Israeli capital, Jerusalem. Zion or Zion means capital. Zion in Hebrew means capital. The capital of Israel is Jerusalem. 
And actually, Zion is called the capital of the world. Jeremiah, Yermiyahu, recalls the first section of Mishpatim. He recalls the reading that we have read this week, which concerns the freeing of Hebrew slaves after six years of service. We read about this this week. King Zedekiah, Tikkiyahu, listens and proclaims liberty to all the Jewish slaves, and the siege is lifted. Okay. In the reading of the prophets that follows in Jeremiah 34, and chapter 33 as well, when, when the Jewish slaves are freed, the siege is lifted. Babylon had come to lay siege. It was lifted when Zedekiah obeyed the prophet. But the nobles, the nobles of Jerusalem decided that it was the Egyptian army that caused the Babylonians to pull back. They believed not that it was God who caused the Babylonians to pull back, but the Egyptian army. Nobles and the people reversed course, taking back their slaves. And so the end came. 586 BC, Jerusalem was overtaken by Babylon. The Lord says that we that he would reject the seed of David, but his covenant, even with day and night, is based on his laws. His laws or rules that go well beyond reason. Okay. Exhortation here. Doing brings understanding and light. In response to Moses Moshe's reading of the covenant, Israel responded with Naasevish Ganeshma meaning we will do and we will obey. Now many also hear this response as we will do and thus we will understand. In fact, uh, the word translated obey here, by the time you get to the reading of the New Testament, that word in Greek is translated as understand. The Greek equivalent is translated as understand because well, it's, this is the way the Bible works. The Bible is not like any other book. The Torah is the sort of document that you only understand when you do it. The covenant we have just described is not one that is understood so that we may do it. Such a response would have the covenant as perpetually idle. The way the Bible actually works is the doing of it precedes the understanding of it. Understanding is likened to light, so also it is likened to good works. We, we remember that when Yeshua spoke to Israel, he said, You are the light for the world. Let your light shine before people, so that they may see the good, the good things you are doing and praise your Father in heaven. Do we also recall Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23 says, The command is a lamp. Torah is light. James said, Don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the word says, but do it. For whoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face, his new birth, the face of his new birth in a mirror, who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately neglects what he looked like. But if a person looks or peers into the perfect Torah, the Torah of freedom, and remains therein, becoming not a neglecting hearer, but a doer of the work it requires, this person will be blessed in the doing of it. He will be blessed in the actual action that he's carrying out. Finally, and in complete agreement with what I've just read and spoken of, Psalm 19 verses 7 through 11 says, quote, the Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring or returning the soul. Now, the word soul here, nefesh, is the mind, and it's actually more the, the, the instinctive part of your mind. The instruction of Adonai is sure. Let me read this again. The Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring or returning the instinctive part of your mind. It is restoring or returning restoring the instinctive part of your mind, renewing it. The instruction of Adonai is sure, making wise the thoughtless. The precepts of Adonai are right, rejoicing the heart. The mitzvah, the command of Adonai is pure, enlightening the eyes. 
The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rulings of Adonai are true, they are righteous altogether. More desirable than gold, than much fine gold, also sweeter than honey or drippings from the honeycomb. Through them your servant is enlightened. Most translations will say, through them your servant is warned. It actually means enlightened. In obeying them there is great reward. Unquote. In summary, my friends, let us shine the good works, the light of Torah, via its good works of freedom, of freedom, and thus cause all to praise our Father in heaven, just like Jethro praised him upon seeing the good works and was converted. It is high time to trim our lamps, filling them with fresh oil, remembering that the lamp is a command. The Torah is the light that it shines. That's Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. So my friends, the, the covenant is not gone. The covenant is still with us, and it has been renewed. It has been refreshed. And it, came, it contains good works that are already uh, prepared for us to do. And when we shine out those good, good works, when we do those things, it causes folks to notice and they, they recognize those good things that we're doing and they are converted. They come to the Lord through that. When light is shined, the light you shine may be a dim light. The light you shine may be very bright in comparison to where you are. You may work in a particular job that only wants you to shine very dim light. It doesn't like it very bright because they're in a very great darkness. I'm not saying that all people work in this kind of condition. But you may work at a job where things are very dark. So even shining a dim light is shining light. Even doing a small favor, maybe opening a door for somebody, maybe giving somebody a smile is shining light. I want to encourage you to do those good things, those good deeds, those good works, and you will cause folks to take notice and they will say, wait a minute, you might have something different. If his presence doesn't go with us, we are not distinguished from anybody else. We look just the same. Okay? My friends, this is what it's about. Let the messenger of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, go before us, go in front of us, and we will be distinctive. Okay. Well, I'm going to be quiet. I wish you a Shabbat Shalom. May you have a peaceful Sabbath. And may you yourself be blessed.